good afternoon. My name is Michael Williams. I'm the uh, policy director of the uh, Economic Growth Program for the American Foundation. Uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to host the Ian Brimmer, uh, author of uh, Preston Keat of The Fat Tale, The political State Power of Political Knowledge for Strategic Investing. Uh, it's a particular pleasure because uh, Ian is, is somebody uh, I've admired for a long time. Uh, he uh, straddles the world of uh, political science and social science. Uh, and also the, the business in finance. Uh, he's educated as an undergraduate at Tulane University of New Orleans, uh, and has a PhD from Stanford. Uh, he went on, not into an academic career, uh, but to become the founder at a very young age of the Eurasia Group, which has uh, grown into, if I'm not mistaken, the world's largest uh, political risk analysis firm uh, with uh, offices in Washington and New York uh, and around the world. Uh, and so, uh, for those of us who think that uh, social science has uh, something uh, important to say uh, to policymakers in, in the real world, uh, Ian's example is uh, particularly inspiring. Uh, people literally uh, put their money uh, on uh, the results of, of his analysis. Uh, uh, he's a, a, a brilliant speaker. I, I have the privilege of uh, being with him on a panel at Tulane University recently. Uh, but I have to say, I was particularly pleased a few weeks ago when Ian, uh, as a part of his uh, book tour for the Fat Tour, uh, was asked to ring the opening bell uh, at the uh, Stock Exchange in, in uh, New York. Uh, and that was two or three weeks ago. Uh, yeah, I, I think if you go back, you'll see that uh, the stock market began to rally uh, <laughs> around the time that Ian uh, rang the opening bell. Uh, coincidence? I think not. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, Ian Brown. Thank you, Mike. Thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I actually forgot that the markets had started to really rally uh, around that day. It, looking back on it, it is true. Uh, I think what it tells you is that there's really a paucity of IPOs right now. So there's a broader group of folks that can actually ring the opening bell. It, it, it was a lot of fun, I have to say that. Um, I also had a lot of fun with Mike down in New Orleans a couple weeks ago. Uh, we, uh, my, my alma mater, I did my undergrad there, but we had a rousing uh, little luncheon session with a, a packed house of students and professors, and, uh, and also had a lunch with the Raging Cajun uh, Jim Carville, who is both fascinating and the dirtiest human being I think I have ever met. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was that was absolutely a highlight. I was like, we, we're going to do this every year, I think. Uh, Mike and I, we have to, we have to get back. So um, I'm a political scientist, and uh, my my axe is not being uh, left wing or right wing, uh, pro liberal or pro neocon. My axe is that politics is mattering increasingly in the markets. That is my strong ideological takeaway. And it puts me in conflict with some economists out there and others, but that's, that's the view. And the fat tail is basically the articulation of that view. Now, of course, because it's a book, I had to finish it back in August. And uh, Lehman, last I checked, went bankrupt in September. So there's not, the financial crisis isn't actually in the book. So it's, in, in one sense, it's been kind of heartening that people have come up and they said, boy, this is a really timely book. But it's a timely book, frankly, because this stuff is structural. Uh, the importance of politics to the global markets has been coming for a long time. And I certainly did not predict the subprime crisis. Uh, I don't make calls on those sorts of economic indications. Um, but uh, it was very clear that sooner or later we were going to be in this sort of political risk environment. Now, first I want to talk about what I mean by fat tails. Fat tails, very simply, if we talk about a standard or normal distribution where the really unfortunate outcomes happen very infrequently, they are thin tails. The fat tails are those one in 100 year storms that increasingly seem to happen roughly every 15 minutes. <laughs> That's the fat tail. And a lot of people have written about that. Uh, my friend uh, Nassim Taleb, the black swan, uh, writes about the importance of these fat tails from the economic perspective. My take is very simple. It's not that there are more fat tails around, though that is true in this environment. It's that increasingly the fat tails are political in nature, not economic. And that means that if we understand that, we have a better shot of anticipating some of these risks, managing some of these risks, 
and maybe navigating our way through some of these risks. Not predicting, not predicting, because I mean, you know, shocks are surprising by their nature, but understanding relative levels of stability and instability for different country actors, for different sectors, for different transactions, does actually matter in this environment. So with this talk, I, there are two basic things I'd like to do um, in the context of the fat tail of both. The first um, is to talk about the two major structural trends, in my view, that are making politics matter more. And then it's to look out over the next one, two years at where I think the big buckets of fat tails are going to come from. That's sort of the talk in a nutshell, and then we'll, we'll take questions and hopefully have an equally rousing discussion. Um, so first, over the last 20 years, there was one thing you had to get right as a decision maker, whether you were in public policy or whether you were in a multinational corporation, that was globalization. And if, to define it uh, in a way that will be useful for the way I'm going to discuss the challenge, uh, I would say in a world system where the multinational corporation is becoming the increasingly dominant economic actor, taking advantage of global economies of scale, uh, labor rate differentials, supply chains, uh, consumer markets, and what have you. Right? That is where the world has been going for the last 20 years. If you missed that, you did badly. Tom Friedman sells 3 million copies in the United States of the world is flat. God bless anybody that gets 3 million Americans to read about globalization because he is able to take that and articulate it to the general reading public. So the first major trend that I see is that that world is done. We are now in a world where in, we've passed the tipping point, where increasingly the state is becoming the dominant economic player. Doesn't mean that it's going to be that way forever, and we'll talk about that, um, but the notion that globalization is increasingly becoming ascendant is now being rolled back. Now, I would argue that this new world of state capitalism has actually been coming for a long time starting with the rise of national oil corporations and OPEC with the oil crisis, 1973, as opposed to international oil corporations, then with the rise of emerging markets over the last 20 years, the BRICS and the rest, creating with it state-owned enterprises and privately-owned national corporations becoming more important. Then in the last five years, the rise of sovereign wealth funds. They've been around for decades, but there was no term sovereign wealth fund until about five years ago because of their relative increase suddenly in importance in the global uh, international investment sphere. And then finally, and here was the tipping point, six months ago, right after we finished our book, The Fat Tail, when Lehman goes bankrupt and the world's capitals come in with stimulus, bailout, regulatory policy, and become the new capitals of capital. So New York is no longer the financial capital of the United States. Washington is. But that's happening all over the world. You used to go to Dubai if you wanted to take advantage of the heartbeat of the UAE and the Gulf. You don't anymore. You go to Abu Dhabi. It's where the political center is. People used to talk about the Shanghai faction is really important and fundamental in China. Nobody does that anymore. Now we want to understand social safety net, consumer spending stimulus, infrastructure development. We want to talk about Beijing. Right? So that's the first move. Now I'm not suggesting that globalization was a good thing and that state capitalism is a bad thing. Globalization was a thing, right? If you lived in Bangalore, you liked it. If you lived in Detroit, you didn't like it. Now, that makes it interesting that today Chinese and Indians and Mexicans and Turks and others all support globalization and free trade on balance when they are asked in surveys, and Americans do not. That's interesting. We can talk about that. But the real point was simply that if you wanted to understand globalization, you would, you would look at that to determine who the relative winners and losers were going to be. In a new world that is increasingly state capitalist, the drivers to determine your winners and losers will be different. And first big trend. Second big trend. We have been living in a world where the United States has been seen since the, cold, the end of the Cold War as the world's unipolar state. 
Now, there's lots of literature out there about how that is changing. Fareed Zakaria, Kishore Mil Babubani, and just about everyone else talking about the rise of the rest. What is replacing a system where the United States increasingly has limited both political will and capital to do heavy lifting to provide global public goods? It is not multipolarity. Because multipolarity is a system where you have different countries, sometimes with competing interests, sometimes with complementary interests, in the way the world should be led. I do not believe that is what we are moving towards. I look at Russia today. I see a country that has a very strong interest in the way Russia should be run. I see a country that has a very strong interest in the way that its neighborhood should be run. And sometimes conflicts with the way some of those other countries view that governance. Places like Ukraine or Georgia. But I see an abdication of interest in the way the world should be run. For example, the non-proliferation regime or collective security in Iraq and Afghanistan or, for example, climate change or, for example, the international financial architecture. I was just in London with some delegation meetings at the G20 last week. And there was no question that the international response to Obama was electrifying. Very different from the largely partisan response, though very supportive on the part of Democrats and somewhat so of independents in the United States, but internationally electrifying, and much more than any of us would have predicted a year ago that any American president could have possibly received from the entirety of the political spectrum internationally. And yet, if you look at what Obama was asking for on this trip, talking about the importance in historic fashion of Turkey being made a member of the EU, and Sarkozy not waiting a minute to say we oppose that, um, talking about the extraordinary importance the US attaches to getting more international support to fight the war in Afghanistan, and ending up with virtually no international commitments on the ground. And of course, after the North Koreans sent up their satellite slash ballistic missile this past weekend, asking for an emergency session at the United Nations Security Council, and the Russians and Chinese unceremoniously saying we're not going to pass this. So great international support, not much movement on policy on these issues, not Obama's fault, structural structural, increasing the fact that we are seeing a move towards a system where there is an absence of leadership on major international issues. So here's the, the takeaway, that if you buy the fact that we are moving to a system of greater state capitalism and greater non-polarity, my point would be that those two systems are not in equilibrium. In other words, they are not sustainable long term. They will not respond well to shocks. They will create their own endogenous shocks. Very important for understanding how international politics and markets interact and for thinking about where fat tails might come from. Give you an example. Uh, I don't know if you all agree with me on that formulation of where the world is heading, but I'm sure there's one thing you would agree with me on, and that's that today the non-proliferation regime is desperately broken. Right? And I think we can all fundamentally agree on that. The, the Americans told the North Koreans, if you test a nuclear weapon, we will be very angry. And they tested a nuclear weapon, we were very angry. We didn't do anything, because we couldn't do anything. Now they have about eight, and we still can't do anything. The Iranians are now moving towards nuclear capacity, and then short of the Israelis attacking them, which is conceivable and more likely than the markets think, but it's certainly not a baseline scenario, then they have nuclear capacity, and so on and so forth. Do I believe that there is any plausible scenario whereby the international system moves to deal effectively with proliferation? Sure, you can come up with scenarios like that. Maybe Hezbollah gets their hands on a serious dirty bomb capacity, plops it on top of a ballistic missile that they now, according to the Egyptian intelligence, have that can hit Tel Aviv and cause mass panic in a city that has 60% of Israeli Jews and the majority of their economy and leads to war in the region. If that were to happen, I can imagine that the Germans would slap serious sanctions on Iran unless they actually allowed a complete and transparent inspections regime in. 
If that were to happen, I could imagine the Chinese would tell the North Koreans, we are going to board every ship and ensure that you are not engaging in the illegal transmission of ballistic missile technologies and nuclear capacity. Um, I can imagine that. Now the good news is, that was a fairly fanciful scenario I just spun. It's not very likely. It's more thinkable than it was a year ago. It'll be more thinkable in five years. But it's not a fat tail, it's a thin tail. The bad news is, short of that, I feel fairly confident that we're going to not see leadership on the non effective leadership in creating a non-proliferation regime that has teeth. And I would further argue that there are analogies to be made on climate change and on collective security and on international financial architecture. And they're not equally broken and they all aren't equally completely absent and devoid of leadership. But the general point, the general trajectory, I think, is similar. When Rahm Emanuel came out and said, as chief of staff, that this economic crisis is too great an opportunity to be missed, he was wrong. It is insufficiently great a crisis for us to take advantage of. There was still politics as usual among Republicans and Democrats in Congress. It still took two months to get your first political appointee actually in place and confirmed for Geithner in Treasury. Uh, it's, I can go on and on. I mean, the, the reality is Americans are entirely too comfortable slash complacent to truly take advantage of the opportunity that we see from this crisis. The good news, of course, is that even if we screw it up, we will get other opportunities to get it right. It'll hurt more, but the U.S. is not an emerging market. Um, so, from a risk perspective, you know, I'm not talking here in terms of what we want policy to be, but in terms of our baseline understandings of likely trajectories, so we can then better assess who winners and losers are likely to be and formulate policy and decisions accordingly. Um, if, given all of that as kind of a 15, 20 minute wind up, let me just talk a little bit about fat tails as I see them out there. Three basic baskets of fat tails in the world today. The first I talked about a little bit already, this idea of the new capitals of capital. The fact that increasingly decisions about winners and losers are going to be made by political actors and not economic actors. Um, now, that creates inefficiencies. Both systems create inefficiencies. The, the hyper-capitalism of the last 20 years with unfettered leverage and absent regulatory policy around financial infrastructure and activities created its own inefficiencies. Those economic actors, those banks, those hedge funds do maximize profitability, but in, in the absence of effective regulation, they maximize short-term compensation, short-term profitability, which creates, of course, long-term fat tails. Shifting to the other side of the pendulum, a system where the political actors are making fundamental decisions in a downturn over who the winners and losers will be will create more political stability for domestic constituencies in the short term, but will have negative economic effects in terms of efficiency and productivity over the long term. So just as in Europe you have farmers that are creating um, inefficient um, you know, agricultural products because they've effectively been able to manage their lobby vis-a-vis EU -vis government, so you have mountains of butter and you have lakes of milk that are unconsumed. In the United States, we will increasingly have mountains of SUVs and lakes of <coughs> ethanol. Uh, very important to understand what the decision-making process is behind that so you can understand where the fat tails are. Um, that's not only true, again, in the United States, it's true all over the world. In the medium term, this creates regionalization of capital flows and in my view is also negative dollar. So if you go to Abu Dhabi, you used to go to the sovereign wealth funds and they had huge amounts of money, so their prioritization of investments didn't really matter because they could give it to everyone. They had Western portfolio managers that were making allocation decisions. They looked a lot like a Western, relatively transparent, private sector organization. In this environment, they don't. Same organization, different decision-making process, constrained liquidity, 
Western portfolio managers have been fired or have been sidelined, political decision makers determining allocations, and serious instability domestically, potentially. So as a consequence, if you are Adia or Mubadala in Abu Dhabi today, the big sovereign wealth funds, the first thing you do is allocate cash to Dubai. And profitability is not your primary consideration. The second thing you do is make sure the Emirates are stable. The third thing you do is you look at your relations with the GCC, and then you can start talking about global allocations. And that is a decision-making process which is happening in some cases greater, in some cases lesser degrees, throughout the Gulf, in Russia, and even in China. Medium to long term, this clearly is going to be a problem for the dollar. Um, do I think that means that China really has the capacity to move short term to an alternative competing currency against the American dollar? Of course not. That was for dom domestic political consumption. But recognize that it was important for, in being for domestic political consumption. Because the Chinese, in sensing this downturn, do not want to be on the receiving end of social instability and dissent. Uh, they want to blame the West for the crisis, uh, very clearly. And if they can't economically decouple, they can at least show that they're politically decoupling. So I do think the U.S.-China relationship is going to become more problematic and more competitive as a consequence of that over the medium term. My concern is not the nuclear protectionism. My concern is that as that system and dynamic plays out, it's going to be increasingly difficult for Western multinationals to do effective business on the ground in China. They'll have a harder time with market access, they'll have a harder time with local competition. So look, lots of Americans don't support free trade. That's not going to lead to different policy because lots of Americans aren't making policy. Corporate lobbies are. But if, and corporate lobbies still support free trade. But if we get to the point that a large number of American multinationals start saying China's a problem, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce does that from, an, from a market entry perspective, then you will see a change in U.S. policy. And, and that, of course, can create the kind of tit-for-tat protection spiral that a lot of people presently are concerned about. Um, so that's the first big fat tail basket. Second big fat tail basket, plain vanilla geopolitical risk, the kind of stuff we see all the time, we've talked about for a long time. Um, if you compare 2009 to 2008, <coughs> with the er ironic exception of Iraq, most of the major geopolitical risks are actually getting more challenging. That is clearly true in South Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, even India, will be in a worse situation at the end of 2009 than the end of 2008. It's clearly true in Mexico, where narco cartels have declared open war against the state of Mexico, clearly going to be worse in 2009 than 2008. Clearly true for Israel and Iran, if there was a likelihood of military activity over that nuclear program, considerably greater in 2009 than in 2008. Same thing is true with potential spillover in Lebanon um, after the June elections. Um, and um, I would even make some arguments about that in terms of potential for Russia uh, to be more confrontational vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine or even Georgia again. Um, none of that is priced in. In a world where we are focused almost purely on the economic crisis, there is no political risk premium for these sorts of geopolitical events, right? So when oil was $147 a barrel, I'd go to a lot of our clients, the trade commodities, and say, what's the premium in a barrel of oil for the Iran price? And they'd say, mm, five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, 25 bucks, some of them. No one would say zero. At $48 a barrel, the Iran premium is nothing. So if something does happen, it's going to have more of a significant impact. It'll be more of a surprise to the markets. Also, the ability of the international community, even the US, to respond effectively is going to be much more constrained because of the extraordinary focus on the domestic political crisis. I mean, when Obama was president-elect and the Israelis invaded um, the uh, Gaza, um, and, and he was asked when he was in Hawaii, what do you think about that? His response was, there's only one president at a time. Now, Obama did not say that when he was asked about the GM bailout, because the priority was domestic. Understandable. Not criticizing Obama, but let's be clear, as these fight, and it would be the same thing if you had McCain or anyone else as president, but as you start to see some of these geopolitical issues coming to the fore, the effective ability to respond is going to be more constrained than they would have been before the financial crisis. Third point, last point in terms of fat tails, is that we are likely to see 
as a lagging indicator that this severe economic downturn will cause serious social discontent. Uh, Blair's that, well, Blair's talked about that, others have, but of course it is a lagging indicator. It's not something we expect in the U.S. or in major developed states, but in emerging markets it is a problem. And usually you're talking 12 to 18 months before the beginning of a serious downturn hits when you start to see the major unemployment effects and the lack of social safety net and subsidies really start to play into political instability, which means we haven't seen it yet, uh, but we will. And there are some countries in that regard that we should be quite concerned about. Uh, Venezuela would be one, Argentina would be another, Turkey would be one, Ukraine, Russia would be one I'm particularly concerned about in terms of uh, countries of scale maybe Thailand, um, Egypt, there are some others. Um, that is clearly going to be helped a degree by the expansion of the IMF and its uh, lending and credit facilities over the course of the last week. That's significant. Um, and, and, and the seriousness with which the G20 actors have taken the emerging market issue, I think, is beginning to, to actually create more of a buffer. It's also obviously helpful to be part of the EU space as opposed to outside. One of the reasons Ukraine is particularly in trouble is because everyone in Europe recognizes that anything they do for Ukraine, they have to do a lot more for everybody in the EU space. So be careful what you actually plan if Ukraine is the first one that actually falls off a cliff. Um, in the context of those three fat tails, let me end with some positive stuff, which is where do I see serious resilience? And we could talk about the US and the resilience of the United States long term, um, but leaving that aside, which has much more to do with uh, a broad variety of factors that aren't just around political risk, but in the short term, and I really am talking 12 to 18 months, people that do five and 10 year scenarios, and there are a lot of them in Washington, a lot of them in corporate uh, headquarters as well, let's face it, from a political risk perspective and an economic stability perspective, those five to year, 10 year scenarios nowadays are almost useless. They are almost useless because there is just too much uncertainty in getting through this financial crisis and what comes afterwards. What we really need to do is pay attention to the 12 and 18 and 24 month scenarios, which are vastly important They've been at any point since I've been a political scientist, with the recognition that the potential scale and scope of those scenarios is much, much broader than it used to be. The possibility for serious discontinuity is much greater. <coughs> As we look at that 12, 18 month scenario, what are the places that I think show a lot more potential for resilience? Number one, China, uh, in terms of lack of social instability, in terms of ability of the Chinese government to actually power through with, re with relevant stimulus. Um, and maintain greater growth in the markets generally expect. I would absolutely say that they're high on that list. Saudi Arabia, and, and the Gulf states generally speaking, even the Emirates, but certainly Qatar and Kuwait and Bahrain. Um, I would say Brazil, uh, with Lula's 80 plus percent approval rating and a strong consolidation of the political spectrum around him and around the political center makes a big difference, plus the resources <coughs> that he has, natural resources he has at his, uh, at his command. And then at fourth, I'd probably say India, which is the slowest moving good story in the world and has been for a long time. But a lot of what makes them a slow moving story also makes them more resilient in the face of things like social and political, local, localized instability. Um, so I do think that there are some places in the near term that we can start to look at as being quite resilient and actually being relatively well placed to weather what we're going to be continuing to see over the next 12, 18 months. So I, I hope you enjoy the book. Uh, it's called The Fat Tale. I thank uh, Mike and my friends uh, at the New America Foundation uh, greatly, as well as at Foreign Policy uh, Magazine, with which I participate, uh, for organizing this. And I'm looking forward to chatting with some of you guys uh, through Q&A and informally. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Sooner than established economic centers are likely to come out of it. Let's say that that's true, and in 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, it's Chinese growth that's really starting to lead a global recovery. Let's say, you know, the Gulf, you know, starts to, to assert itself more as a financial center, as a financial player. What are the geopolitical consequences of that if it's the countries that you identify, China, GCC states, India, Brazil, if it's these states that really um, have a positive scenario economically that's internationally recognized well before the United States or Europe 
or Japan present such a scenario? What are the geopolitical consequences of that? It's, it's a question I suspect we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about over yeah. the coming year. Um, let me first you know, talk about how things aren't changing, of course, which is the reason the dollar is still doing well, right, in, in, in part is scale. It's just big. So, I mean, even though the U.S. economy is feeling kind of parlous right now, at the end of the day, it still feels like a flight to safety in a way that I don't understand why the Swiss franc does. And does. Swiss franc is still doing very, very well. It's, it's operating like it's gold, but actually anyone that looks at political risk around Switzerland and money laundering and the rest should understand that Switzerland has changed. I think the answer to that, by the way, is that the, the, literally, I hope I'm not right, but I think the answer is that like local financial advisors in you know, sort of the middle of Illinois just don't follow that story. And so they're still advising all of their clients, hey, the Swiss franc is where you go, the Swiss franc is where you go. I, I fear that there could be a real short opportunity there, and that, that would be a bad thing uh, for its stability in a place like Switzerland, which we wouldn't need. Um, but at the end of the day, of course, um, the U.S. is still going to have that scale. It's still going to be the world's largest economy by a significant degree. A lot of the major technological developments going to happen. The scale of the stimulus in the U.S. is much greater than anywhere else in the world, much greater than anything you'll see out of China or the other countries we're talking about. And so even if the United States takes a while and the growth is sluggish, and I use as my baseline expectations kind of consensus economic projections out there because I'm not an economist. Um, so clearly that is going to leaven the geopolitical effect. The enormity of America's military superiority over the medium to long term also has a very big defining impact. And the fact that even if the US is not going to lead internationally the way it has over five and 10, 15, 20 years ago, the fact that still there will be a relative absence of leadership will mean that for many countries around the world, the United States will still de facto be, you know, sort of first among not very much, right? Um, it might not get you as much as it used to, but it will still feel somewhat gravitational. So I think the trajectory has changed, but nonetheless, for those that want to talk about continued Pax Americana, there will be people, that, there will be arguments that will be able to be made for hangers on. Um, but it's going to be different, and it already is different. I mean, being in London last week at the G20, one of the things that struck me that really went almost unremarked upon from a geopolitical perspective was how absolutely everyone at that meeting, politicians, media, and the rest, referred to the U.S.-China meeting as the G2, mm -hmm. right? In other words, China is the putative other superpower in the world. No, it's not. And the Chinese certainly don't act that way. They're not prepared to act that way. Um, but nonetheless, that's kind of what people are talking about. So that means that folks are looking and will continue to look to these countries for their ideas about how the world's architecture and infrastructure should look. And one of the things we need to recognize is that that's a problem for the G20. Because historically, over the last decades, the notion of these financial and economic institutions is the West has a model, the US is out in front, and American allies are pushing it. If you, China, or Russia, or anyone else wants to join, you basically accept our model. And we get to criticize you if you don't move fast enough towards our model. And what you have the Chinese and others now saying is actually we don't like that model. I mean, the movement from the G7 to the G20 is not purely a coordination issue. It is not just a matter of hurting more cats, though that would be harder. It's hurting cats and animals that don't like cats. And that's not hurting, right? And that's where we're moving. So I think geopolitically, the absence of basic agreement on values on how the world should be structured in terms of the, the marketplace and economic activities and the rest is going to prove increasingly confrontational. That's why I think the U.S.-China relationship is going to be very hard to manage. Oh, thank you. Oh, yes, sir. David Fishman, Public-Private Legal Partnerships. How has the mix of risk changed in the six months since you finished writing the book. And I'll, I'll use a specific country example, but there may be some others you bring in. In Russia, the conventional wisdom was until recently that uh, the government was attempting to renationalize and you know, seize the oligarchs, push them out. 
In the last couple of months, it's gotten a little fuzzier. You're Putin and Medvedev saying, well, you know, it would be easier to take over the oligarchs because they're going way into debt. The government wouldn't have to lean on them. They're basically ready to collapse. But they don't want to do that. Some of the discussions they're having, some of the discussions they're having are the same kinds of discussions we're having about what, you know, how does the TARP get run? So would you comment on both that specific case and the more general question of how the mix of risk may be changing? Well, Russia's in a very different environment today than it was six months ago. First of all, a third of their reserves are gone, right? Part of that's currency, uh, and part of that is, uh, is ne necessary stimulus and spending in a much different oil price environment. Now, you raised this interesting question, right? So Russia invaded Georgia when oil was at 120, and a lot of people said, well, if oil had been at 40, they wouldn't have done that. Of course, oil was at 40 when they cut off Ukraine for a few weeks, so maybe geopolitics trumps economics even in that sort of environment if it's important enough. But here's the question. Tom Friedman has this sort of big theory out there, it's talked about in foreign policy, right, this whole petrostate issue, that when oil prices are high, that's when you have to watch out. When oil prices decrease significantly, then these countries are going to become much more amenable to working with the international community and letting the multinationals back in and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that is true if the governments of those states feel that they can last easily for the long term. In environments where they feel that there might actually be a real threat to their stability in a more short-term environment, imminently, then I don't think they do that. I think they actually act to shore things up and they close the system to a greater degree. Venezuela. Venezuela runs a deficit when oil is under $90. It's a disaster. They've been destroying their economy, right? PDVSA is a disaster, right? All you need to do is bring in any multinational corporation to run their oil sector, and you'd have 500,000 at least minimum barrels a day more coming out of that country. That makes a difference. But Chavez has gotten to the point that there is, there is such a feeling of concern domestically that I don't think that the downturn is going to lead him to take a more open position. I think that, and you see this with the first decision to nationalize Cargill a couple weeks ago after he narrowly won that, uh, that referendum. Russia is an interesting question. Saudi Arabia, I think they'll act in a more open way. Most of the Gulf, they will. Russia, which of those two camps are they in? I don't know. But I tell you, when I look at Russia today, and I look at this, the, the money they've been spending, and I look at the, the percolation of some low-level conflict between people like Shuvalov and Sechin, you know, on the liberal side and on the Siloviki side, recognizing that Putin hasn't shown his cards yet, they don't know who they're going to let go bankrupt, if anyone. They don't know what kind of social discontent they're going to have. It hasn't hit yet. So when the social discontent really hits in Russia, Russia is the one major country out there that I can imagine a 1930s style scenario. Because you have massive power consolidated in the hands of one person. Putin is, in my view, the most powerful human being in the world. Right? Russia is not, but Putin is. And there's, there's very limited institutional constraints on what he does. So as a consequence, the, the potential breadth of scenarios for Russia much, much greater than they are in lots of other countries. And it's very opaque. I'm not suggesting it's going to happen, but I think those risks are there. There are risks that they will simply stop capital flows, they'll put capital controls on. There are risks that Western multinationals will be shut down, that major CEOs will simply be arrested. I don't think those are real risks in a country like India or China in the next 12 to 18 months. I think they actually are in Russia. But one other thing I can say to respond to your question, how has the risk environment changed since September, is that there are very major political risks coming out of developed states. That's new. I mean, you look at, we put out a top risk piece at the beginning of every year, top political risks in the world, and we do some red herrings as well. If you go back to what we put in January, Iran was up there, Pakistan was up there, Russia was up there, Mexico was up there, U.S. Congress was number one. Number one. And, and that's because the potential for inefficiencies coming out of Congress, even if they're relatively small, have such an outsized effect on the global economy when we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars. And that's where the decisions will be made. When Obama comes out and says, if Washington doesn't get this right, we face economic catastrophe, his words, not my words, 
that he's also saying, doesn't matter what the banks do, doesn't matter what the automotive plans are from the biggest three, doesn't matter what else happens from all these other multinational corporations, it's all about Washington. It's not Wall Street, it's surely not Main Street, it's K Street. And uh, you know that makes what happens around this town uh, a much greater political risk, as well as an opportunity, don't get me wrong, but it's changed the risk environment. I used to, when I started my company in 1998, I was focused on emerging markets, countries that I defined as places where politics matter at least as much as economics to market outcomes. That is my definition of an emerging market. And I'm increasingly finding that many of the lessons that we have drawn over the last 10 years are interesting and applicable in developed states. That is abnormal. It will not be true for the next 10 years, but it's true for the next 12 months. That's interesting. Do you have some other questions? Yes. Tom Scott, your CSIS. Sir, you say the uh, financial and economic capitals are moving back to uh, towards the political capitals. You say it's not New York anymore, it's uh, Washington, D.C. Um, does that mean that we're going back to a sort of a renaissance of the Westphalian system? Do we go back to the structures of state powers, state actors that we know? Or does the globalization introduce new political actors, multinational, transnational uh, political actors? I'm thinking of Al-Qaeda, which definitely has no state to back it up. I'm thinking of groups like uh, uh, Hezbollah, which is definitely not a state-backed um, um, organization. So with this reemergence of political capitals, do we see new actors, or are we going back to the old uh, political actors that we know? There are certainly a multiplicity of actors, and some of those actors are subnational, some of them are transnational, some of them are regional, and some of them are, are supranational. I and mean, if you think about, for example, I think the growing importance of the GCC in the Gulf as a regional organization, and the <coughs> Americans play less of a role, will be more important and as we see a common currency come out of the Gulf as well. I think that um, ASEAN and other regional Asian groupings will become more important for political and economic integration um, in the Asian region. I think that will definitely happen. So not all of this is negative, right? Not all of this, of, of the, the non-state actors, are things that are going to blow things up, like Hezbollah, um, or more directly, and certainly more, more agreeably for everybody, um, at, not agreeably, but something we all agree on, uh, Al-Qaeda uh, as, a, as, a, as a destructive organization. Um, let me, um, but I also would say that I don't believe the system that we're moving towards in terms of these new capital of capital become, that this is a long-term global system. There is a very big difference, in my view, between the political power and economic power being exercised by Washington or by London to what is being exercised by Beijing or by Moscow, right? Because in the United States, I mean, you know, you have transparency, you have rule of law, you have a stated desire not to actually own this stuff forever. Um, and frankly, the regulatory policy that we put on some of these companies will make them want to get out from American control as soon as possible. We've already seen that with Goldman Sachs. Um, when, when the uh, law was being debated around uh, having this tax on the AIG bonus recipients, um, I wrote some op-eds around that. A lot of people did, and I said we shouldn't be, the president shouldn't be spending his time on $165 million because there are more important things for him to do. Not that I wasn't outraged by the notion these guys were making the money, it's not where I focus. And I, and, I, and I also made the argument that, that writing a piece of legislation like that is the kind of thing that you would see in an emerging market. But, let's be very clear, if that had happened in Argentina, those guys are out of cash. If that had happened in the United States, we're getting lawyered up, right? Those guys are getting sued. And then they're going to end up after very long and lengthy class action lawsuits and the rest. People are going to get paid. The lawyers will make most of it. But there is rule of law, right? And so I think we need to recognize that there's, there is a, um, a, uh, a difference there in terms of the kind of importance in five and ten years time that some of these new, new capitals of capital will have in, in perpetuity and some won't. Which is why my response to Flint's question was there's going to be conflict because these models are different. The whole world may be moving to one model now in crisis, but once that crisis is over, you're going to have two models. But one of those models will be emboldened 
And my concern is just because hypercapitalism was shown to be inefficient does not mean the complete absence of rule of law and transparency and corporate governance is a good and workable system long term. All right? That's that's what we're going to be facing. That's where the argument's going to be. Do I believe that other organizations subnationally are becoming more important? Of course I do. One of the biggest trends that makes political risk matter more over time is the diffusion of dangerous technologies. Right? I mean, Moore's Law tells you that every 18 months, computer chips get twice as small, twice as fast, twice as cheap. That is, of course, also true of improvised explosive devices in Pakistan. It's also true of ballistic missile componentry for Iran. It's true of nuclear technology as well. So clearly, that is going to further embolden rogue states, organizations, and even individuals and make them more important as disruptive actors that we will need to pay more attention to on the international stage. What we have seen in the last six months is that one specific type of, of, of non-state player has become less important, disenfranchised. And that's the multinational corporation. And frankly, with <coughs> many types of NGOs because a lot of their funding comes from the private sector. Do I think that that's permanent? Not in the West, but it may well be more lasting in some other states, and that will be interesting. Oh, yes, sir. Of course, in the use of the international tornado crisis, I was quite surprised by your assessment of the resiliency of the Arab states in the Persian Gulf region. Uh, if you remember, the, uh, for the, during the second half of last year, uh, collectively they, they lost over $2.8 trillion. You know, for a uh, combined population of uh, probably less than what we have in California, that's a lot of money. Uh, they have very little experience with that sort of, uh, you know, change. Uh, their population growth is high, and they have you know, quite a few problems. In fact, I think Iran has a much better chance uh, of, of uh, you know, competing at least with, with those states uh, with much larger population because of the experiences that Iran had during the Iran-Iraq war in the 90s and, and the fact that oil income is a much smaller portion of their total budget. So how would you compare the two and, and why do you think that they, they are going to be that resilient? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. I really appreciate it. First of all, let me say that when I say that the Gulf is going to be resilient, um, I would actually include Iran in that group. Uh, I think that Iran stands to, if we don't see a blow up in Iran over the next 12 months, caused from geopolitical conflict, which again, I, I think is more possible than the markets consider right now. But if that doesn't happen, in a year's time, the, the risk premium around Iran goes down. And it goes down for one of two reasons, right? One, new facts on the ground in Iran, and the United States says, okay, we've got to cut a real deal now that the Iranians will accept. They work with the Europeans. The Iranians say, okay, you're going to allow us to, to, to have these facts on the ground, just like North Korea, effectively. And, uh, and then you, you start to get uh, investment again. And the GCC comes in, and the Chinese come in, the Russians come in, and so forth. Or the Americans don't do that. The Americans say this is too dangerous. We demand that you not engage uh, with this nuclear technology, and we're gonna, we, we are going to continue to focus on it. But the Americans increasingly lose the ability to get other countries to stay on board. Because the Iranians have already powered through the nuclear capacity, and as a consequence, the Chinese say, what's the point of keeping sanctions on? We're going to do business with them. The Germans say the same. The GCC say the same. And so it's the same outcome for Iran, just the Americans are irrelevant. And either way, if you are Nippon Oil in Japan, in two years' time, you should be investing in Iran again. That's, that's become a good play for you. Um, and uh, that's not going to be happy for the Israelis to hear. They're going to be very, very concerned about that. So there will be a fat tail around conflict between Iran and Israel. It's going to exist, and the proxies in the region. And of course, a lot of Americans that are you know, sort of sympathetic to that are not going to like it either. But I think that generally speaking, if Iran can get through what is going to be a very dangerous next 12 months, and they might not, but if they do, then Iran is going to be pretty resilient. Um, of course, Iran also, I mean, the, the stuff you were talking about in terms of very difficult to do business in Iran, I mean, given the whole sort of Bazari background and also the extraordinary opacity of Iranian bureaucracy and those that have been trying to do business, I mean, look at Impex, their experience with the Zadagan, it was about as bad as Libya. 
um, in terms of trying to actually cut through the opacity of how to work with these guys. So I, I wouldn't be optimistic about saying the Iranians are better than many of the Gulf. The Saudis are much more sophisticated from an oil perspective than the Iranians are in this regime. For my, Saudi Aramco is a real multinational corporation. Um, the, um, in terms of the resilience I see in the rest of the Gulf, I mean, oil prices right now are near 50. Um, with both the increasing geopolitical risk that I see around much of this stuff, the fact that you're not seeing investments in an under $70 environment in the Canadian oil sands or, let's say, offshore Brazil, and the fact that I see resilience in China, all of that means to me we're likely to see a much higher oil price environment over the next couple of years. I'd be willing to bet on that. Um, and that, of course, helps all of these Gulf states. Um, plus the fact that many of these Gulf states do actually have a fair amount of support domestically through having built up significant package networks over the boom time. And, and I think that also matters. And you see that most directly with King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia, who is now taking this downturn as a real opportunity to, for example, bring uh, Prince Naif um, up, up, the, up the food chain. And I expect that uh, Crown Prince Sultan will step down because of his health and that's going to make things much more clear around succession. Um, and I, I think that will take a risk away from Saudi Arabia. You look at what they're doing with bringing um, women um, into the cabinet and also into the university system, which will, of course, bring down demographic explosion. And by the way, women throughout the Arab world, you go to the Emirates right now, they outperform the men because that's the one way to get out of the house. The men get jobs when they're done. You're unlocking the productivity of half of that population. Now, these are not liberal societies. Women don't drive in Saudi Arabia. They don't get equal jobs. They're not treated very well. But from where they were five years ago, the transition is extraordinary. So I think that if you want to talk about relative resilience, for me, Gulf still looks like a pretty good bet. Dubai does not, but Dubai gets bailed out by Abu Dhabi. They got their first 10B, they'll get more. That's my general view. Well, we've got time for a couple more questions. and I think we'll bundle one or two together. Uh, so here and then there. Your first. Uh, Meredith Broadbent with the Global Business Hour. You're predicting resiliency in China, but more friction, I think, with the U.S. Um, how do you think the U.S. multinationals will react to that, and will there be a change in the lobbying of Congress at all? Um, <clears throat> Marvin Ott, Faculty of National War College. Uh, as an Asianist, um, I was struck that Indonesia never gets mentioned. It remains the most important country in the world about which we know the least. I would argue it is an important uh, entrant on your resilience side of the, of the picture, but it tends to be consistently overlooked uh, despite its scale, and I just, just note that. Uh, the other comment, and this is really kind of preaching to the choir, I suspect, but I wonder if uh, another driver or determinant or variable in your team ought to be the quality of decision making. That we're entering a period in which, you know, if you can replicate the George C. Marshalls and the Atchison and the Kennans, uh, if you can put real brain power <coughs> effectively to bear on some of these problems, where you can do that, influence and power is not a thing to aggregate. So that agency, in that sense, is, is, a, is a critical variable in this kind of environment. Well, you certainly want to have quality decision making, but of course, that would argue that structurally, that by itself is increasingly not getting you um, there. I mean, I think that there was very, very high quality decision making around America's, Obama's new decision to what to do with Pakistan and Afghanistan. Fair. I mean, some of the best minds in the world brought to bear, and they listened to America's allies as well. And yet, the decision that's being taken. Um, is, uh, you know, at best, you know, sort of very, very risky and probably won't succeed. And it's just because of an absence of, you know, relatively easy uh, win scenarios when the U.S. can't do much lifting by itself. The problem is significant. Pakistan can't be part of the solution. And uh, there aren't many other countries that are prepared to participate. So uh, I might almost argue that agency matters a little bit less than it used to simply because of the constraints on the U.S., though Lord knows at the very least you want to get that right. Um, I'll have a better answer for you on Indonesia, which is if I had five, 
uh, they would have been, as opposed to India just being number four, I, Indonesia probably would have been number five. Um, I like Indonesia a lot, um, and I find that, you know, uh, and interestingly, one thing that the Indonesians I find have going for them is the fact that they are just so incredibly insular when you talk about the senior business makers, the senior business, the oligarchs in India, whether they are Chinese or local Indonesian, they really focus on the Indonesian market. They're not very interested in, um, uh, in Islamic finance, they're not very interested in, you know, sort of playing the global markets. They're focused on developing Indonesia. So in times, when times are really tough, they take the pain first. In Russia, the first way you know the Russian Marxism collapse is watch what the Russians are doing. They're gone before you are, right? They have absolutely no interest in that market. And I think the fact that, you know, we've gotten through the, there was a possibility of Megawati. There were six months ago, people thought Megawati was going to win. I was in Singapore at the time, and they were referring to Megawati as the Sarah Palin of Southeast Asia. <laughs> In Singapore, and that 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 is that's quite branding for Sarah Palin, um, and uh, but I mean I think we've gotten through that, and we've gotten through it in part because he's just been consistent, and he now has the possibility um, with um, you know with with um, uh, what is a gold car looking like they're going to come down in the polls um, to to actually get rid of some of this more intransigent nepotism that's been plaguing him at the cabinet level. So I, I, Indonesia to me looks quite good. It really does, uh, but it's just rel it's still relatively small as a market, and it's something that not many people pay attention to. So I don't either. I didn't talk about Africa either, and yet you know, Africa. If you if you gave me a hundred million and said, Ian, you got to stick at some place, and you can't touch for ten years, it's gonna be diversified. I'd put it in one continent. I mean, Africa. Right? If I were sixty, I wouldn't. But I'm thirty nine, so I'm prepared to go for it. Um, on the on the China side. Um, I mean, no, I, I'm 60, I'm just spending it, you know, I mean, at this point, it's much more fun. Um, on, on, the, on the China side, I don't know the answer to that, because let's face it, if you're a U.S. multinational doing a lot of business in China, it's dangerous for you to be out front saying China's giving us a hard time, right? I mean, Google does it, right? If you're Cisco, you try not to, uh, because those guys cut you down. I mean, you know, the platitudes that are being sung publicly when Boeing and Microsoft meet them, very different from what I hear from corporate executives about China when we go and hear what's going on. And, you know, Coca-Cola, I mean, they were in there and they were out in front on the Beijing Olympics and have some of the best relations with the Chinese government of anyone out there, and yet two weeks ago they were prevented from buying this juice company. Last I heard, juice was not a strategic sector in China. No explanation as to why they couldn't buy it, just can't. So I suspect a lot of this is going to happen quietly and privately with, you know, sort of uh, with key congressmen and constituents, and so it'll start happening and percolating before you actually know it. But there'll be a big, there'll be a big tipping point. It'll come from like one big company that has way too much exposure that just gets hammered. And I don't know who that is. One could have imagined, you know, like the Walmart situation when, when the trade union suddenly became an issue for them, right? That could have been, it didn't. It was a smaller issue at the time. Something like that is coming. And, and I, I expect this is going to be problematic. It's one, it's one of these indicators that we need to watch very carefully over the next three years. One thing I would say is that this was the last election that we'll have for a generation where you can vote for a president and not know or care what their views on China are. I don't think that'll happen again for a generation. I think those days are gone. I think we still have no idea how important China is going to be in the U.S. political spectrum come 2012. I think we have no idea. And I am a little fearful that we're not going to handle it well. Bush made massive mistakes around the Middle East. On China, policy was pretty good because you had Paulson in charge who was a real China hand. He had real respect on the ground there. He knew what was going on, but everyone was seconded to him. It was his. So the policy was, you know, focusing on the importance of this economic relationship, and he was he was on it. Now Geithner's a little too busy to do that. Last I checked, right? And you know the relationship is going to be much broader. It's going to focus on a bunch of stuff. It's going to be very challenged, but a lot of different people are going to have their hands in that pot. We know that's a recipe for less efficient policy making. I'm a little concerned the structure is not set up as well, even though we have very very smart people in terms of agency. Uh, in many ways, better people in terms of agency thinking about China across the board, yet I think the policy may actually end up being worse, and the relationship may suffer. It's going to be tough. Should it's a tough environment. Geographically, you've left out Latin America. Yeah. Comments. Sure. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about Brazil.
from a from a you know getting excited about it uh, perspective, I and I talked a little bit about uh, Venezuela. I think one of the interesting things is Latin America's not. I can't see them working as a region, right? I mean, the, the notion that everyone had been talking about the notion that you were going to have this strong populist upsurge in Latin America that was going to really challenge the Washington Consensus and all this. The reality is, of course, that's absolutely not going to happen. In fact, you know, when Humala ran for the presidency in Peru, he lost in part, in large part, because he was perceived as too close to Chavez. In Mexico, when Obrador ran, he lost, right? And mostly because they stole the election, but also because he was seen as too close to Chavez. I mean, that really did decrease his popularity. And I think, okay, you can talk about Castro, you can talk about Morales, big players, but at the end of the day, you know, support, the populist support in Latin America in, in, in a kind of, you know, really um, anti-free market way is just not really picked up. People are seeing the benefits of growth. And I, I think that even in the context of the serious downturn, the extraordinary support that Lula actually has and the commitment that he has shown to you know, trying to keep a pretty even keel from a policy perspective on some difficult things like, you know, um, what do you call it, foreclosures for certain types of mortgages for the middle classes that actually has allowed huge investment in the real estate sector. Who else is doing that? but that's happening in Brazil. I, I think that's actually quite positive. And again, that's where everyone wants to invest because they've got the biofuels, they've got the oil offshore, it's the biggest economy. Uh, Mexico's the one you have to be worried about. You know, India, our clients are saying, should our CEO go? Because you know, the Taj and the bombings and everything else. Mexico, our clients are saying, should we have expats there, right? And I mean, I had heard there were a couple of uh, attempted uh, attacks on the uh, U.S. Embassy in Mexico City that were broken up. Um, I don't think they made them press. And I, I, again, I don't know the exact timeline, but sometime last year. If something like that had happened, it's a very different environment in the United States in terms of how we think about Mexico as an investment. And let's keep in mind that the remittances for Mexicans going down to Mexico, for living in the United States, fall off cliffs. Uh, it, you have to. I don't think Mexico is in danger of becoming a failed state. It's a little shocking that the debate has even moved in that direction for some. Although it's probably just people that want to straw man and get op eds in the IHT. Um, I don't remember who that was, but I remember one. I was like, come on. But at the same time, I think that as a political risk factor for an investment grade country, this is serious stuff. And if I were, you know, as I am advising a lot of our corporates out there, I have to say, yeah, you've got to be much more concerned. Uh, about where this is going. Thank you, Ian Bremmer. Uh, the book is The Fat Tale. Uh, please join me in applause for Ian Bremmer.